Good morning, everyone. Hi, my name is uh, Joe Arnold, and uh, I'm the CEO of SOSAC. I'm joined here with, by Didier Contes. Good morning, everyone. And you're all in for a treat. So we're going to walk through a use case um, of, of what Georgia Tech is doing uh, with Swift. So my name is, so again, I'm Joe Arnold, and I'm a, I'm a CEO at SwiftStack. And what we do at SwiftStack is we build OpenStack Swift. We have a lot of developers who are on the core team of Swift, and we've built a, uh, a product around Swift, and we help enable our customers deploy, scale their OpenStack Swift environments. And I'm Didier Contis. I'm the director of IT for the College of Engineering at Georgia Tech. And as you know, Georgia Tech is a university a few miles from here. All right, OpenStack and Swift. What, what Swift is, is an object storage system. And what that means is that you put data in and out of the system via an, an object API. And in Swift case, what that means is it's, it's over HTTP. So you get, you post, you put data into it. It's not a file system. Um, and, and so that's the way you, in, you interface with it. The benefit of, of an object storage system is that there's some, per, some properties of scale out. There's a multi-tenancy built in, massively concurrent, uh, runs on Linux in Swift's case, and we can, we can, it can be powered by inexpensive uh, standard-based hardware. And the origin of, of, of object storage really came from the first initial public clouds, at least in its current iteration. And Amazon introduced a product called S3, if you're familiar with that world. And what Swift is, is a open source project where you can run your own version of an object storage in your own data center. And it powers, uh, it came from Rackspace and they built that to power their competitor to S3 called Rackspace Cloud Files, and then they released that into the open source as part of OpenStack. And that was a few years later, and here we are today, and we've, we've, that project has continued to power lots of public clouds. What, how Swift does data placement is it distributes data across as what we call as unique as possible. So whether that's a small environment or a large environment, data can be, gets placed further apart, which makes it really tolerant of failures. And that's exactly what we're gonna walk through with, uh, with, with this use case, is how that gets used. And so the objects are distributed around, and you can get access to them via an object API, which is over HTTP. But in this context, and a lot of the use case uh, that we're gonna be talking about here is, is having an application which speaks SIFs and NFS so that existing workflows, existing applications has a, have a way to get access through that data through, through those uh, protocols. Okay, thanks, Joe. So, um, Georgia Tech, you know, we are universities located a few miles from here. We have a lot of students in engineering, and we do cool stuff. Um, you know, before OpenStack, before the public, private, hybrid cloud, you know, as there was some things that we called our federated condominium systems. Um, here's an example. This is our, you know, farms oriented toward VDI and applications where, you know, research groups, IT departments can come and bring servers, and in exchange we have a platform as a service where, you know, um, our IT groups can publish applications toward our students as part of virtual labs. This is another form that we've been using around HPC where faculty research groups can bring and you know, bring their servers and exchange. The servers get integrated into an HPC infrastructure and our faculty can run you know, um, large scale applications. So these are kind of our pre-cloud environment. Our faculty, our research groups, they love to compute things. They love to do simulations. But you know what? They even love more their research data. And it's not only the users of our VDI farm, of our HPC farms, it's all our faculty. They love to acquire, to create, to exchange, to receive research data. Have you ever seen a grad student on a Friday afternoon receiving a box from FedEx or UPS full of USB drive with large data sets? They're really excited. <laughs> um, you know, 
some our faculty do f fun stuff. For example, we have this van driving across um, the highways in Atlanta with a bunch of sensors. It looks like some kind of you know Google uh, you know car. And what they do is they record data around you know the condition of the road, of the pavement, you know of the bridge, and they record a lot of data. For example, for every mile they drive, they acquire 2.2 gigabyte of data per mile. Once they come back home and uh, you know, offload the data and start to do the post-processing, the they generate an additional 1.2 gigabyte of data per mile. So far, they have 16 million of files on a simple white box servers, and this is not very efficient. Here's another example where instead of creating data, we acquire data. In Georgia, we had, a f with the Interstate 85, a project regarding converting a natural lane, a high occupancy uh, lane, into um, a high occupancy toll lane to try to have uh, the congestions relieved for 85. And as part of this conversion, we have a research groups which trying to study the impact. What they do, they have access to a direct fiber a network feed from the Georgia Department of Transportation and have access to all of the cameras recording the videos. So far, they have recorded 400 terabytes of data. And guess what? All of the servers, all of the file servers they thought they will be able to use and have enough storage, they're full. They have to start using USB drive left and right to make space. They have to try to scatter, uh, scavenge free space wherever they can. In addition of you know, acquiring, receiving, exchanging research data, we have another small issue. Uh, recently, there has been a mandate issued by the White House regarding data creations. That means that once a research project is done, all of some, all, or some of the research data generated or created have to be created after the project is done so that other researchers across the country can access this data and start to do um, research. That means that now, once the funding of the project is done, we have to figure out where we're going to be storing this data for the long term. We're talking about 25, 30, 50 years. So you wonder, OK, you told us you have all of this research data. Where do you store them? Well, first of all, we don't know how much research data we have. We know we have a lot. Just for HPC, we have two petabytes of storage. That's a lot, but we probably have more petabytes. Um, in addition, we don't know where to store them using the gold plating enterprise storage our typical storage vendors are trying to sell us. Yes, I could buy if I had an infinite amount of money, um, basically the scalable, highly available um, NAS system. Well, can't afford it. Backup is becoming a problem. Guess what? When you have a cheap white box server with 16 million files, it takes a lot of time to back up these 60 million files, especially if you have just a bunch of SATA drives. But more importantly, our single biggest challenge when it comes down to storing research data is the USB drive. You know, this is the new storage on demand. You run out of storage, you just go purchase an additional USB drive. Is that efficient? No, but it's our vision of storage on demand. Here's an example. The story says that sometimes, important research data might be stored on not so reliable storage systems. There is a urban legend at Tech about an unconfirmed report of a cheap NFS file server that may have been in action back in 2006. A research group reportedly bought a cheap refurbished desktop system, added a bunch of USB ports, attached 13 plus USB drive, exported each USB drive as individual NFS man point for a research project. So now, what kind of redundancy do you have with this? Are you going to be running a red array on top of USB drives? Backup? Could you repeat the question, please? Anyway, so you get the point that we have some challenges when it comes to research data. So we also have challenges when it comes down to compute. Our magic answer to our problems, meet vapor. It's a hybrid cloud. 
what they thought is, is our vision of bringing all of the various projects we have. You know, we have people that are studying in College of Computing, um, you know, so uh, OpenStack. You know, we have all of these large farms, whether it be an HPC farm or a hypervisor farm for VDI with a lot of unused um, horsepowers. And so we're starting to have a project where various academic departments at Georgia Tech are coming together and say, we are going to federate all our, you know, forms our projects, and we're going to be probably using OpenStack as one of the federation technology. Um, and this cloud, both for compute and for storage, is basically going to be in support of instruction and research. It's going to be distributed and federated, distributed across the campus, but also probably distributed beyond. We know we're going to have to integrate in our hybrid cloud, you know, public providers like AWS, Azure, Rackspace. One more thing, we need to be able to iterate very quickly. We have to be able to go fast, 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 like someone said during the keynote, to adopt the new technology. What are we going to be doing with this hybrid cloud? Well, you have your typical you know, um, workload. We're going to have ephemeral computing, a lot of pet computing. We have a lot of graduate students still needing some kind of dedicated, permanent, personal workstations. What a hybrid cloud will let us do is be able to do scale up in terms of memory CPUs. Infrastructure as a service, if you need some small compute which doesn't require the high speed and, you know, interconnect of HPC. Platform as a service, hey, I just need a bunch of MySQL servers or Hadoop clusters to do some research. This is, you know, the overall visions. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go into details for each layer. Yes, there is no OpenStack components listed. This is on purpose. This is a diagram we use to, when we brainstorm on what technology we're going to be using. For this talk, I'm going to focus specifically on the data storage layer. This is where we have invested a lot of time. So this data storage layer, its purpose is to store a large portion of our research data. And frankly speaking, this is a Swift, Swift stack talk, but we know that we'll probably be a need to use additional um, technology, additional vendors. Some of requirements, it has to be distributed and resilient. Why? Well, sometimes we have building going offline during a weekend for electrical maintenance. Sometimes we have, you know, a fiber optic cable being um, ruptured by a contractor like it happened a few weeks ago. We want to limit vendor dependency. I'm sorry, we love our storage vendors, but sometimes, you know, the relationship with the storage vendors goes south. And we don't want to be taken left, you know, with a bunch of data we cannot use. By going open source, we feel it a bit safer. We want to be able to leverage de facto standard, S3 Swift. Multiple entry points, you know, um, object is great, but we want to be able to access the data via other means. Um, and we want to have a flexible design. If we are going to be using this data storage layer, we don't want to have to migrate the data, you know, in three, four, or five years. I cannot tell to our faculty, hey, sorry, we're closed for business for 12 months. You know, we have to migrate three, five petabytes of data to another storage platform. Not going to happen. So we have to be able to have a storage layer which is going to, uh, you know, um, be for the long term. In summary, you know, this data storage layer is going to be supporting several services. You know, research data for active projects, long term storage of the data for data creations, Data repositories, if we want to share data with other institutions. Okay, so now is a good part. Why Swift? Why did we go initially with Swift, Swift Stack? Well, Swift is open source, so that limits obviously the vendor lock in. It's a turnkey approach when we use Swift Stack. You know, I think it took us 10, 15 minutes to get the first uh, you know, version of the cluster going in, so very quick deployment. We like the fact that there is a lot more activity around Swift, and so there is a growing ecosystem. We're starting to see more and more middleware or applications being able to support natively Swift as a backend. This is great. The system is robust. We love the fact that you know, we can rely on replications. You cannot, I cannot tell how many times we've been burned by Red Array going AWOL and how much data we've lost and had to restore from tapes. So price is right so far. What we don't like? Well, it is object storage, meaning it's not easy to use when you're used to use file systems. You know, there is um, um, an uphill battle in terms of adoption. And it's a fairly young project product. So there is a bit of risk for us. 
Some of the research projects that are starting to adopt Swift, you know, we've talked about a couple of projects, obviously, um, we are targeting for these adoptions in terms of uh, transportation-based research projects. We also have, you know, um, a lot of projects going on in aerospace engineering and biomedical engineering that we are targeting. How do we, t how do we approach a research group and say, hey, you know, yes, okay, you've run out of space on your file servers. I have this wonderful uh, product, services. It's called Swift. It's going to solve all your problems. Researcher, okay, yes. Uh, give me um, a drive point. Uh, give me a share, you know, uh, an FS share. Sorry, can't have. What we're doing is we're trying to tell the research groups, look, you have a lot of research needs, but for the purpose of your research, it would be really great if you learn how to talk to Swift using the API. Because while you'll have an, up, uh, an upfront investment in terms of time, you'll be able to benefit down the road in terms of index indexing, metadata, scalability, large scale performance, being able to run zero VM, being able to run Hadoop. And so, you know, we spend a lot of time talking to our research groups, trying to educate them. We even give them, you know, um, free incentive, hey, if you use Swift, we'll give you 10, 20 terabytes as a freebie for you to start to use our system. Some of them do, and some of them don't, and they say, I really, really, really need a way to talk to these wonderful systems using SIFs or NFS. Why? We said it already, object storage is difficult. But there is also a lot of workflow, which is based on files. Our students are always, you know, are all the time using Linux applications, Windows applications to be able to run post-processing jobs, to be able to run simulations. Latency speed can be also an issue when we use a file system gateway. So in the case where a research group says, I need to be able to use these wonderful storage systems via uh, a SIFS and um, you know, access method, we are starting to deploy basically the Swift gateway. We also are looking for a solution that will give us a GPFS access, and we're thinking about you know, other solutions. What about if we write the data to a high-speed NAS and we use some kind of storage abstraction technology to move the data back to Swift? And, and so the, the design goals that we had for the, the file system gateway was really to try to drive so no data lock-in. And some of, the, some of the constraints of the existing gateway products that will represent a file system and then back into an object storage system is that the only way to get the data in and out is through that gateway. And that's because they'll take that file and they'll chop it up in, in, in a proprietary way and then put that back into the object storage system. So the, the idea behind the, the file system gateway uh, application that, that, we've, that we've built is to allow data to come in via a file, and then also come out via an, a, an object API. And that means that in this context, where if a researcher is building an application to put data into it, they're often used doing, doing that via an application, so object APIs are the best way to put that data in that way. But then if they get to a workstation and they have a workflow, then they can get that same object out of the system via a file system. And so it just gives the, the, the best of both worlds in a, in a way for, for accessing the data. Uh, the, other, the other issue sometimes with the, with the file system gateways is that they're built with uh, using a single public cloud account in mind. And when you go to a private cloud deployment, that's, that's usually not the case. Every user on the system has an account and you're keeping track and you're accounting and you're gaining access to users um, based on some other centralized authentication system. So I wanna make sure that that also plugs back into that authentication service so users can have their own shares and, and manage them separately from others. Thanks. You know, earlier I talked about, you know, this research data creation problem. We've talked about a lot in this presentation so far about how we're going to be using or how we're using Swift to store active you know, uh, research data for active projects, but what is our strategy to also handle the research data creation problem, which is a different problematic. So we have a project which is led by the Georgia Tech Library, 
which basically is taking an existing repository, which is DSpace, and migrating this repository to a new technology called the Fedora um, Repository Infrastructures Framework with something else called Hydra, which is going to be used by, um, as a head, as the access mechanism by which you access the repository. Right now, you know, I've talked with the lead developer for the project. Um, you know, they are deploying Fedora 4 for those interested um, as a way, to, you know, Fedora 4 that would connect to Swift. And in order to do this Fedora to Swift connection, they are using the JBoss model shape and InfiniSpan storage subsystem for those who are familiar with the technology. Initially, and that kind of goes to the ecosystem and development, the InfiniSpan sub-storage connection is going to be using the Swift S3 um, you know, emulation layer in order to access the data. There are some work done on testing whether or not they'll be able to use um, the, Rex, the Rackspace Cloud, file, Cloud Files API to do the connection. So how have we, are, how have we implemented Swift across the Georgia Tech campus? Well, remember, we're talking about a federated and distributed academic cloud. So we have a bunch of zones um, in the Swift clusters, but each zone is um, managed and owned by a different academic department. So in a sense, you know, the School um, of Industrial Engineering is operating one zone. Um, so Central IT, IT Services for the College of Engineering is operating another zone. Um, so it's a distributed management. It also means that no one can own the cloud in certain fashion. We expect to bring additional zones. So far we have three zones. We believe as more additional departments takes interest into this project and add resources will grow, grow probably to five, six zones. And on our roadmap is leverage, to try to leverage some of the peering agreement with some of our, uh, you know, not peering agreement, but more hosting agreement with some of our peer institutions to be able to have an additional regions located in a different state. And replications will take place using some of the internet to high speed networking we have access to. What hardware are we using? Well, like everyone else, we are using a bunch of white box servers. Um, one thing we've tested up front, not necessarily the greatest way to get the best performance, is we are leveraging the fact that um, Swift doesn't care about the hardware configuration as much. So Swift is very to tolerant of having an heterogeneous configuration. So some zones have more storage nodes than others. Um, you know, some zones are using primarily 24 bay chassis. Some zones are using uh, 12 bay chassis. We have a mix of you know, enterprise and consumer grade. We always have this debate you know, within our IT community. Some departments prefer to use enterprise grade, I mean, uh, drive. Some departments prefer to use consumer grade drives. All our storage nodes, at least most, 90% of them, are connecting, connected using 10 gigabit. Um, we are using the LSI SAS RAID adapter. Um, one thing, if you are using this LSI 9211-8i you know, SAS adapter, make sure you flash it to use the integrated target firmware. Most of these card ships with the integrated RAID, and that's not necessarily the best use case for Swift. Um, bunch of SSDs for the account ring containers, typically 60 gig to 120 gig uh, for configuration. Our biggest challenge from you know, the hardware configuration is figuring out what memory to terabyte ratio we want to use. You know. um, so for maximum performance, the recommendation is to use one gigabit of uh, memory for each terabyte of disk space you have. That can become very pricey if you are using you know, a configuration with 24 or 36 drives and using four terabyte drives. Our management approach is distributed. So again, you know, each zone is managed by an individual team uh, which shares administrative responsibility. One thing we are finding out is that there is a lack, at least with the Swift Stack controllers, in terms of um, permission delegations. Uh, you know, the granularity is not there yet. And that means that if we want to let an IT group be responsible for the management of the storage nodes, they, in this sense, have access to all of the storage nodes. There is not a way to restrict a specific group of people to only manage one specific um, set of storage nodes. So here's a request for the roadmap. Finally, students, you know, our student workers are a great resource, and we use them to replace their drives. This is great when they know which one to replace or when we make sure that they don't replace, so when we make sure they don't pull, 
a walking drive. The nice thing is that before student goes to uh, you know, a storage box, pulls a wrong drive, boom, you have now a 24 hours rebuild time with a RAID 6 array. Here, say it pulls a wrong drive, eh, we have three replicas, you know, and the system will just rebalance and we'll just you know, correct the error, so it's pretty good. We make a lot of usage of the integration between Swift Stack and LDAP. You know, we need to be able to have our users being able to leverage our credential on campus. Initially, we were considering using the Active Directory integration. We took a serious look at it and decided, no, we better to wait. So we waited a few more months, so that delayed the, um, you know, the project until Swift Stack had a strong implementation of LDAP. The code is great. It took us literally five minutes to do the integration, just you know, using the GUI, having a service account for the binding, and here we go. What we appreciate is that overall, the LDAP integration seems to be fairly robust. We have seen in the past lots of products not being able to play nicely with a large-scale LDAP um, you know, directory. Ours has around 300,000 um, accounts. Uh, two million entries for having all of the people information because of, of all of the students that have enrolled or applied at tech. So, so far, so good. Uh, one thing, right now, access to the cluster is not restricted. It means that anyone, any student with valid LDAP credentials can use our Swift cluster. So please don't go ahead and don't tweet this information to our students. I don't want to find out coming back to campus that I've run out of space. <laughs> People typically ask us, okay, so what is a financial model? You know, how do you plan to you know, pay for this? How do you, are you going to have you know, TCO and ROI? Are you going to do chargeback? And the answer is no. I'm sorry, if you're expecting a bunch of financial data, you're not going to find this in this slide. Our number one goal is to ensure that you know, a lot, a vast amount of research data reach this you know, uh, vapor hybrid cloud, reach the data layer. So we have to keep it simple for our research groups. One way to do that is, first of all, limit the recurring cost. Our research groups, because of the way research is done and funded, don't like recurring cost. So we're trying to absorb the recurring cost, like licensing or you know, things like that, at the central level, and instead we try to engage the research groups the departments into funding the infrastructure. So that means, for example, you know, developing different models around bring your own. Bring your own zone. You know, if a, re if, um, um, a new school, a new department wants to take part into the project, bring your own rack in your own several rooms. Just more capacity for us. If a research group wants to buy your server full of drives and you know, use it, fine. Just let's do the ingest of the server. Bring your own drive. And so, you know, we're not, going to be have, we're not going to have any kind of fancy financial model using, for example, Bitcoin or things like that. We're going to keep it simple. You know, rather than talking hard cash with our research groups, we're going to say, buy us drives. And so we see that in the future, this project is going to be focused on using hard drives as a form of currency. I don't care how much our research groups are paying for the hard drives, I just want drives. So, you know, Research groups A comes and say, I have four terabytes of data to store. Fine, buy me three times four terabyte drives. And it should be cheaper than buying three USB drives, by the way. Okay, that sounds like a good idea. But, you know, drives have a finite amount of life expectancy. What happens when this drive starts to fail? How are you going to re replace the drives? Well, we're kind of, you know, taking a bet here. We are betting that when the drives start to die in three, five years, new drives will be you know, bought by other research groups and start to replace a failed drive, except that these you know, new drives will be probably eight, 12 terabytes. So if there is any drive manufacturers into the audience, please ensure that in three, five years, we have 12 TB helium drives or something equivalent. Okay, it's a lie. We have the clusters. It's been running for you know, at least a good year. Um, What's next for us? Well, we plan to implement quota. Uh, you know, we cannot let the systems available for anyone to consume. You know, it, it's like leaving free pizzas uh, after you know uh, a conference on campus. 
people find the pizzas and eat it, and it's gone, right? So we want to be using quotas, probably container-based quotas. We can assign quotas on a per-project basis. Lesson learned. We did a quick implementation. The implementation was very successful because of you know, Swift, Swift stack, and it's easy to deploy. But we have to go back and do a little bit of re-architecture. So we have to, you know, re we have to strengthen the proxy layer so we can offer good performance to our end users. So that's going to be our summer project. Whether or not we're going to be using um, proxies with dedicated load balancers is to be um, debated. Earlier, you know, Joe talked about the file system, the Swift stack file system gateway, and you know its benefit. And in our case, you know, we know that we may have to use something else, you know, some of these medieval marriage type solutions, so that um, you know we can have higher level of speed to our end users. Um, if anyone is interested into uh, you know developing a GPFS gateway, that would be great. Why? Because we have a need for um, you know with our high performance computing farm to enable our students to use direct GPFS access to access and retrieve data. There is some interest around that. In our futures, a lot of evangelizations. We see that our number one task is going to go and talk to our end users and educate them on you know, modifying their workflow so they can basically directly use the Swift API to store the data. We have to find a way to wind them off using always file system access. Um, and so one thing we are looking forward is, you know, the development of the Swift stack uh, file system gateway so that, you know, you can have this unified access, whether you come via the gateway or you come via the object store to be able to see the same data. Thanks, <coughs> Thanks Didier. So what, we, what we're working on with at Swift stack, fundamentally, it's OpenStack Swift. So we've been doing lots of contributions uh, to the project. We have project technical lead. We have a lot of the core developers on the project. We run a, a community test cluster so that new functionality has a place to be integrated and tested. And what we've built is a few things. We have a deployment model around how to get up and running, both from a hardware perspective uh, and from a, a deployment perspective. We can integrate that with, as Didier mentioned, things like LDAP, and other authentication systems and monitoring systems. So it can, it can integrate into that environment. And then we have scaling. I mean, talk about adding new drives into the, into the system, being able to do that in different parts of uh, different data centers and be able to fold that capacity in gracefully is, it, 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 there's a lot of orchestration involved in order for that to happen smoothly. So those, those are some of the things we do and, and we support OpenStack Swift. So I believe we have about eight minutes left uh, if anyone has any questions. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, good question. Question on your zones. You mentioned you have heterogeneous equipment. Are the zones still all the same capacity size, and if not, how do you address those issues with? Um, no, so you're correct. Right now, we have an imbalance, um, you know, and I think some of the zones don't have the same size, right? I think one zone in particular is short on space. How we address the issue, we actually rely on Swift to try to apply always the rules of keeping the data as far apart. Um, one of the things we're trying to address is, you know, even if one zone doesn't have the same amount of nodes, we're trying to compensate that by um, having bigger drive onto inside the storage node. So in principle, how this works is if you have a zone that's uneven. So if you have a tiny zone, a big zone, and another tiny zone, that big zone would have maybe more copy. We might have a two copies of a given file in that particular zone, but placed on uh, different equipment or different drives, depending on how size the deployment is. Would those copies in the bigger zone occur only after the smaller ones were saturated, or is the ring adjusted? Uh, the ring will, at, will, will, so how it works is there's a parti partition space that, get, that gets mapped across the entire cluster. And so on average, they would fill up equally well. 
um, by, you know, by disk size, basically. So of the total capacity on a percentage full basis, that would be maintained across the different zones. Yeah. So that, that's how it works. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.